Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Columbia University's 20th Annual Social Enterprise Conference, Capital for Good. I'm Rebecca Manning, the conference co-chair and current MBA candidate at Columbia Business School. The Capital for Good Conference showcases social impact leaders who are deploying capital to generate sustainable solutions to global systemic challenges. This digital event series covers the spectrum of capital from ESG investing to philanthropy. We hope the Capital for Good Conference serves as the hallmark in creating a virtual space on, a, on campus for the exchange of new ideas and best practices from mission-driven businesses and social impact leaders. Today, we will be hearing from industry leaders on the role business can play in addressing the misinformation and extremism crisis we see in the news sector. I have the pleasure of introducing our panel leader and co-president of the Social Enterprise Club, Dean Mizell. Dean. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today's panel is going to address the rise of misinformation and the responsibility of business in fighting misinformation and extremism in online platforms. Uh, in this session, we're going to uncover potential solutions on how the news and tech sectors can and have been working together to address this problem. So I'm very excited to welcome our panelists. Uh, first is Anthony Cousins, who is the CEO of FactMeta, which is a company that uses AI to monitor internet content, analyzing its risks and threats. Prior to serving as CEO of FactMeta, he was involved in countering Taliban propaganda in Afghanistan and in combating Al-Qaeda's recruitment in the UK. He was also closely involved in the UK government's response to the social media revolution in Egypt across the Middle East. We also have Gordon Krovitz, who is the co-CEO of NewsGuard, a technology tool that uses trained journalists to rate the credibility of news and track misinformation. Before founding NewsGuard, he served as a publisher for the Wall Street Journal, where he was also a weekly columnist, uh, writing a column titled Information Age, and he served as an executive vice president of Dow Jones. Um, and to moderate this panel, we have Professor Anya Schifrin, who is a senior lecturer and director of the Technology, Media, and Communications at Columbia's School of International and Public Affairs, and she has earned her PhD in the topic of dis and misinformation. So Anya, I'll hand over the mic to you. Welcome and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be back at the business school. I had a wonderful year there as a night badget and uh, never really left Columbia after that. Um, Thank you for also mentioning my doctoral research. My focus was on solutions to mis- and disinformation, and I divided them up into supply and demand side. So I started by looking at things like fact checking, and building trust in media and media literacy, and I ended up looking at regulation. Um, and regulation is ever more relevant. Uh, I was just in Brussels last week talking to colleagues of Gordon's about the Digital Services Act, which the French really want to make sure is passed before April, because in part because of their elections. And when I was looking at this whole spectrum of solutions, the ones that really attracted me were the sort of market-based solutions that were kind of in the middle. And that's really how I think of NewsGuard and FactMeta. I think of them as solutions that avoid us, help us avoid the problem of censorship on one hand, and too much government regulation into free expression, but also are more scalable and realistic than things like media literacy and fact checking, which are incredibly important, but are very time intensive. So I really am so excited about this area where uh, Gordon and Anthony work. And I wrote a report in 2019 that included little profiles of a number of organizations, including theirs. And I'm hoping that today, Gordon and Anthony will be able to talk to us a little bit about what they do and you know, how, what are the, what's the sort of market potential for this. So um, that, I guess, is my opening uh, questions for you both. And I know we'll have time for audience questions afterwards. Thank you. I don't know who wants to go first. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go first because I'm already off mute, Anthony, but nice to see you. Um, maybe let me start by giving the audience a little sense of what NewsGuard does and how we go about doing it. Um, we are in the online safety industry, a new industry. In fact, Matt is another of the few companies in this industry. Um, the problem we set out to solve when we founded NewsGuard three years ago was uh, the infodemic of misinformation online. 
and the use case that we had particularly in mind was somebody uh, scrolling through their Facebook feed and seeing news stories about this and that and having uh, no practical way of knowing was a source that they were seeing in their social media feed or in their search results, was that an authoritative source or alternatively a source of misinformation, disinformation, government propaganda, healthcare hoax, et cetera. So what we did was we identified nine basic criteria of journalistic practice. Um, does the website have a corrections policy? Can, can a reader learn who owns and controls the site, for example? And we uh, hired a staff of journalistically trained analysts who have rated all of the news and information sources that account for 95% of engagement in the countries in which we operate, currently US, UK, Germany, France, and Italy. Every website gets a point score from zero to 100 based on those criteria. And for consumers, there's a red or green icon and a nutrition label, which is a detailed explanation of the site. And for consumers, we work with third parties uh, who already have distribution. Um, I think you know, we are what's now being referred to as a middleware solution. So for example, Microsoft for its new Edge browser makes NewsGuard ratings available to all the people using Edge as a way to differentiate its browser from brand B. Um, and what that means is that people can see in their feeds, Facebook, Twitter, what have you, search results, alongside virtually any news story. There'll be an icon giving somebody information about that domain, about that website. So we're not rating at the article level. We're saying this is generally a trustworthy source or this is generally not. And for readers who are interested, it gives them an instant way of determining, do I want to rely on this source or will I be better off relying on a different source? Um, we'll, I think we'll talk about this particularly given the topic. Um, our, our, we, that's our consumer facing business. We also have a business for companies, for brands, um, addressing the same problem, but from a programmatic advertising point of view, which is it's in the nature of programmatic advertising where brands have no idea where their ads are running. The ads are being selected algorithmically to go to the lowest bidder. The result of that, uh, based on a report we did with Comscore a couple of months ago, there's about $2.6 billion a year unintentionally being spent on misinformation sites. To give an anecdote, the largest advertiser on Sputnik, the Russian disinformation site, is Warren Buffett through Geico. So Warren Buffett did not wake up one day and say he wanted to subsidize Vladimir Putin. This is in the nature of programmatic advertising. And we use our ratings to create an exclusion list. Here are the sites you really probably don't want to be on. And also inclusion lists, which vastly expand most advertisers' range of sites they want to be on to include high quality news and information sites. And the result of that actually, encouragingly, is a lower CPM for brands if they're no longer on misinformation sites and greater engagement. So that is a case where you can uh, capital for good. In this case, it's doing good and doing well at the same time. So I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop there. But that, that's what that's what NewsGuard does. And uh, Anya, I, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about middleware as a solution. I think that's probably a new concept to most of the people in the audience. Um, Gordon, I also had a question for you. You were telling me some fascinating study the other day about how labeling does, in fact, discourage people from forwarding false news. Would maybe you'd like to let the audience know about that? This is a tremendous area of academic research, as you can imagine. You know what works. What? How can we stop misinformation? And Ani, as you said earlier, I think in the early period an awful lot of pressure was put on fact-checking as the solution. The problem with fact-checking, as wonderful as it is, is it is literally by definition after the fact, after a claim has gone viral, after people have you know, heard about it, it's very hard, to, very hard to undo and doesn't scale well. 
you know, there are millions of pieces of false information on the internet. That's very hard to, to scale. So uh, rating at the domain level, at the website level, that's been now researched by many academic groups, uh, misinformation advocacy groups, independent groups. And th they all say the same thing, which is that if somebody uh, sees in her Facebook feed or his search result, red icons warning that this is not a reliable site, they tend not to believe it or to share it. Um, and in that way, it pre-bunks hoaxes. So our data indicate that almost all of the popular examples of misinformation or hoaxes are coming from the same several thousand sources masquerading as news and information sources. These are sources of misinformation. You know, some of them are, you know, teenagers in Macedonia. Some of them have political uh, motivations. Some of them are Russian, Chinese, Iranian government operations. And some of them are healthcare hoaxes. Or they're doing it, you know, for the money. But in any case, by pre-bunking, uh, we're able to warn news consumers. This site in the past, to give an example, claim that the 5G technology caused cancer when that same fairly obscure French website uh, was the first to publish the claim that 5G caused COVID. People who had access to our ratings knew that that was probably about as true as 5G causing cancer, in other words, untrue. And yet we saw in the UK, Canada, elsewhere, people literally attacking 5G engineers who were putting in masks to enable the 5G technology. So it's a, it's a very serious problem where it's not surprising that millions of people are misled. The algorithms of the digital platforms are geared not for accuracy or safety, but for engagement. And we now know uh, so well that what engages people tends to be the highly divisive, emotional, and often false information, not the more reasoned, analytical, accurate information. Thank you, Gordon. Thanks for that update and um, on this new research. And Anthony, really looking forward to hearing about how Fact Matt is doing and also very interested in this link between the earlier work on extremism and, and what, this, what solutions and fixes people are looking at today. Thank you for that. Thank you for coming. Yeah, cool. Uh, and Gordon, thank you for mentioning 5G. It's an interesting uh, side to a uh, misinformation narrative I'll talk about in a sec. Um, so to explain what Fact Matter does and, and what we're up to, um, I won't talk too much about the programmatic advertising side because Gordon did a really good job explaining it there and we do a, a basically the same thing. Our models are in the same places that you can find some of the NewsGuard models. Um, so we're, we, we are doing a bit of that, but our primary focus um, is actually on um, misinformation, disinformation and other forms of harmful content, racism, sexism, toxicity um, in the media monitoring space. So um, I guess to, to explain the kind of the transition of the business or the growth of the business over the last few years, maybe since when you know we last caught up, uh, Anya, um, we started out in that in that same space. Like, how do you automate fact checking? How do you how do you put an automated solution in place for this? And actually, over the last few years, that's kind of grown and morphed um, as it as it tends to do with young young technical companies. Uh, it's grown into um, we can't just be good at finding the bad stuff. We also need to be good at finding the good stuff because the people that we're selling to, the people we're talking to brands and agencies um, aren't just interested in the bad stuff. They, they are also more generally interested in generally what is going on and what is also good. So that that caused Fact Matter to, I guess, grow and uh, it kind of increase the scope of what we're trying to track to the point where actually what we've now built is generally a media monitoring system. Um, so specifically geared and really good at analyzing online social content, but also articles and, and news as well. Um, so effectively what we built is the ability to look at all of that content uh, group uh, similar themes and similar opinions together 
um, and to, to so to use the 5G example that Gordon just mentioned, we were tracking uh, conversations about uh, vaccines uh, in the UK, which crossed over with conversations about um, 5G for a satirical purpose. Um, so people were joking that when they were getting their yeah their vaccine shot, they're like, oh, now I'm good for my 5G 5G reception. Um, so I think it's it's interesting that um, they all cross over, the narratives cross over. But what Fact Matter has built is a suite of signals to identify. This is a narrative people are talking about 5G UK. Um, they, they, um, they're talking about getting 5G reception of the shots. But it, in, in our fake news model, um, and in our kind of high partisanship and our kind of quality models, we would have flagged quite high on that one. But we'd also flagged quite high on our satire and our humor. Um, and so basically what we're trying to do is give brands and agencies um, a more holistic view of the content online. So that we're not, and Gordon knows what this risk well, um, that we're not accidentally flagging kind of satire or really good quality investigative journalism on racism or sexism. We're not flagging that as the content itself so that accidentally, you know, funding for advertising or, or attention is getting drawn away from that kind of content. Um, we're actually kind of highlighting it in a good way. So yeah, um, helping brands and agencies on stand being said online, finding of that content, what of it is fake news and um, uh, and harmful content and what of that is actually satirical and actually not worth worrying about um and that's what we're selling to brands and agencies via a self-serve SaaS sign up model it's um I, th I think i'm relatively confident in saying we're the first company um to offer a completely self-serve ai insights product in the space um, but that's what we're what we're up to um anthony who are your who are your customers and how big do you think the market is for the kind of work that you do um, interesting, depending on how you look at it. So um, right now we're selling to agencies. Um, so people who represent brands, and that's a, a commercial strategic decision um, that agencies are, are quicker to buy, easier to sell to, easier to talk to, um, and they represent multiple brands. So effectively, the, the end beneficiary of our particular product is brands, because brands are the ones mostly interested in how is my brand being perceived? Um, I, am I at risk of getting cancelled if I say this or I don't say that? Um, so they're the ones interested in in what is being said online in the opinion of the public. Um, but in for most parts, the larger the brand, the more agencies are involved in that conversation. So we're selling directly to agencies right now. But actually, I think if you take a few few years down the line, um, the growth of our prediction um, kind of experience and our prediction functionality and the level of insights um, and starting to integrate things like you know, machine writing. Um, so basically kind of automatically creating the content to allow brands to automatically counter the fake news and the harmful content, um, that takes us into a place where actually we start to disrupt the agency model in itself. So right now we're in the media monitoring market, um, but actually whilst that's kind of a good sized market, the bigger market is the agency market, like you know, multiple billions, 50, 60, 70 billion, depending on which stats you're looking at. So um, yeah, although that does pale in comparison to the size of the programmatic advertising market, which Gordon spoke of 155 billion. Um, or more even, I think, maybe this year. So um, yeah, that's that's where, where we're playing. We've got a, a, a toe in the water of the programmatic advertising market, but actually what we're trying to do is, is create a new market for sales and disrupting agencies. So um, that sounds a little worrisome. It sounds like all our journalism friends who lost their jobs in journalism and went into communications and advertising are now gonna be replaced by automatic run. <laughs> the, the, the argument any AI can be made, it's not about replacing people, it's about elevating them. <laughs> Um, so well, make it, maybe making even more automatic out anyway. Well, but what I also was wondering with from both of you, um, and this is a bit of a, a blunt question, is shouldn't Google and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, all the companies that are doing this kind of screening work, are they being hired by the big tech companies or do they do it in house? And this new regulation from Europe, will that create opportunities for smaller companies or is it not something that the big platform, do they not work with small companies? Like what, what's that mark, market like? When I was writing my report, John Battelle, I remember just said, you know, Silicon Valley is such a, there's, it's controlled by so few companies in a way that there's such a monopsony that there isn't really room for the smaller players. And I was wondering if when I, when I wrote this report a couple of years ago, I felt like there were a lot of sort of optimistic small companies that were growing. And I'm kind of curious to know what's happened to that, to that set field, really. I, I think, sorry, one of the, one of the uh, interesting features of the industry, to answer your question, is there's one thing that Facebook, Google, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, et cetera, all have in common. 
which is that consumers don't trust them. And consumers don't trust them in this area because they operate in secret. They blame algorithms as if they didn't craft the algorithms. When they do react to content, they do it on what's often perceived as an arbitrary basis. And they've made a lot of mistakes. My favorite example is uh, when RT, the Russian disinformation publisher, became the first news channel on YouTube to get a billion views, a very senior executive of Google went on to RT to praise RT as you know, very successful. And the reason for their success was they were authentic and not propaganda. You know, since then, they've had to register uh, with the Department of Justice as a foreign agent, and that is their model. They don't actually pretend to be doing news except to consumers. Professionals understand their actual role. So you ask, is there a role for smaller companies? I, I think the way I would put that is um, it's inconceivable to me, given where those companies are in terms of trust, that they're going to be able to solve this problem on their own. And that's why Microsoft <clears throat> licenses NewsGuard. Microsoft is a bit more mature uh, digital company. They've gone through their own maturing process when it comes to these kinds of issues. And they wanted to take the lead, I think, uh, because they understood that technology companies are great at many things, but this sort of um, work is not one of them. So the, in the UK, there's the online safety bill that's making its way through parliament. In the European Commission, there's a code of practice on disinformation. NewsGuard was invited to become a signatory along with the large platforms. That includes a requirement that consumers are empowered <clears throat> with information about the nature of the sources that the digital platforms are distributing or promoting to be done by an independent companies, not by the platforms themselves. And in the UK, to the Americans in the audience, the easiest way maybe to understand the UK legislation is to say that uh, the US may have passed section 230 that gave immunity to a large degree to the digital platforms at the beginning of the commercializing of the internet. But the UK wants its common law obligations back. And it's telling the largest platforms, just like a chemical company or an oil shipping company, you need to take steps to reduce the harms that we now all know you're causing. You're causing a form of information pollution rather than spilling oil or chemicals, but it's the same concept. And the, the obligation will be in order to retain some form of immunity, they'll have to take quite specific steps to protect their users. And the UK government has identified several dozen online safety tools that they could choose among. Um, so I, I, I think you, you're certainly right that it's difficult to be a small player in this highly consolidated industry of, of digital technology. I think this is a rare case where the dominant digital platforms, uh, in order to regain trust, will need to rely on third parties. And interestingly, at least from our conversations with them, there's a broad acknowledgement that the, this kind of problem requires humans in the loop. This is not a problem that can solved by artificial intelligence. Uh, members of the audience could <clears throat> go to cancer.news and cancer.info. One of those is the American Cancer Society website. The other one, which actually looks more professionally produced, will sell you a monthly subscription to Peach Pits to cure your cancer. There's no way in the world machines will be able to determine the difference between those. So I'm quite optimistic that there's going to be a place for middleware solutions, as we refer to solutions like uh, like ours, um, but it may take uh, legislation to force the platforms to take on responsibilities they haven't had. You know, if you've got a whole industry that was born to be immune from liability, we shouldn't be surprised when that industry acts as if it's immune from liability. So when the online safety bill passes, when the European Commission's code of practice is toughened up a bit, I think we'll see a change in practice by the platforms and 
to me, the biggest question is whether they'll change their practices in the rest of the world or just wait until there are regulations or legislation in the US and other parts of the world. Um, I was told uh, in my meetings in Brussels and Paris last week that the EU Commission very much views themselves as regulating for the world. Although I have to say that some of the conversations I had with, with more senior people, I'm not sure that they looked at it that way. Um, Henri Verdier, France's digital ambassador, put it very sort of clearly. I think a lot of the French um, view this as similar to banking regulation, where you're not looking at every single transaction, but you're saying, do you have, as you said, you know, first of all, make a risk analysis, and second of all, demonstrate that you have systems in place. And then third of all, we will spot check to see whether that's functioning. And what Henri said to me was, you know, banking regulation started, I don't know when it was, 20, 30 years ago, the main law was don't bring a suitcase of dollars over to the bank and try to deposit it. But that over the years, it got more nuanced, sophisticated, and detailed. So Henri said to me, you know, this is really an ongoing, we regulation is an ongoing conversation between the companies and the regulators. Now, Gordon, as a University of Chicago grad, I'm not sure how you you know, feel about that, but that sounds to me how they're sort of thinking that this is really kind of a first step and then an, uh, you know, ongoing conversation. So I don't know if Gordon wants to respond to the Chicago so me, comment. Or yeah, let me, I, 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 yeah, let me respond to this. I, you know, Chicago economists believe in uh, the common law as well. And, I, you know, to me, the original sin, which I supported at the time, to be clear, as a columnist, the original sin was the Section 230 immunization of the digital platform from basic common law liability. To me, that was a form of, of unintentionally, uh, unintentional government regulation that has led to where we now are. If you tinker with the common law, you should expect there to be unanticipated consequences. And that's, I think, where we are with the digital platform. So the online safety bill, the efforts in Europe, to me, are simply an effort to treat the digital platforms like every other industry. You always put things so clearly. On. Thank you, Gordon. Go ahead, Anthony, and please. I'll, and I'll add on to Gordon's point um, and disagree ever so slightly on one. So I think um, when it comes to, to the opportunities for smaller platforms, I think the growth of the safety tech industry as a whole in terms of uh, the size and also the number of players, I think is good evidence that actually it's, it's actually good news for smaller players uh, and contributing to this to this problem. Um, and like, I'm happy to say the UK is one of the leading countries um, you know, working on that. Um, we're a founding member of Ostia and, and kind of playing some of the same circles there. It's, it's actually really good and really exciting times now for us. Um, and I think that's in part due to the problem that, that Gordon mentioned around the lack of trust in those larger platforms, but also I think personally, just a general change in the attitudes and the interests of, of the people that they don't want to be part of those same giant platforms for every single one of their conversations. Smaller platforms um, like Guild uh, as a community platform or even like larger forums have been around for all, like Mumsnet, you know, for example. Um, I think people generally might be more interested in, and it feels like a, a change in um, uh, in the tide that people are interested in joining communities that are very specific to the kind of conversations they want to have and aren't monetized as heavily um, as uh, the sites like Facebook and Instagram, et cetera. Um, so I think that's that's an interesting um, kind of growth and every one of those smaller players as they grow need to start to account for that problem more so, right? When they start off, they don't care so much about moderation, they could probably handle it with, with a team. Um, but where I might slightly disagree with um, Gordon on the use of AI, I think AI is fundamental to our approach to this. Um, uh, it's, you definitely need to have humans in the loop, but if you want to be able to scale your efforts, using AI to prioritize um, and to kind of kind of organize the content that humans need to review um, and maybe even checking up on your human's decisions, that's, you know, there's going to be a fundamental role for AI um, in this in this puzzle for sure. Um, but I don't know, Gordon probably wasn't meaning to make that point, um, but... <laughs> No, and, 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 and no, Andrew, you're, of course, you're, you're absolutely right. And we actually have a product used by intelligence agencies and defense ministries that is seeds for AI. So uh, it's a catalog of all the leading misinformation and hoaxes to which AI is applied. And you're absolutely right. That allows, for example, uh, somebody to find the 
provenance of a hoax? Where did that hoax originate? Who sh shared it? What kind of accounts were sharing it? So that some kind of steps, mitigating steps could be taken. But you're absolutely right. This is an area where, you know, it's a mix of HI and AI. And I, I think my basic point was that the digital platforms themselves don't have the HI in the loop. They're trying to do it only yeah. with AI, which, you know, will not work. Yeah, I mean, look at Twitter, um, for, for example, anytime one company, um, the, the kind of role of smaller companies in helping, like, it doesn't matter how big the company is or how expert the AI is, um, because it's so hard to avoid the bias issue. Um, you know, Twitter, for example, I think classically, came, it was like, what, four weeks ago now, maybe in startup time, that was maybe like six or eight weeks ago, came out and admitted that their home feed was biased towards conservative and, and right wing content. Um, and they didn't know why. Um, that it's, it's so hard to avoid the bias creeping into your, to your work at some point um, that I think even if you're a larger player, I know some of the large players, Facebook's a good example, doesn't like to, to use technology from elsewhere. It's like, you know, not built here attitude. Um, but I think whether they see it or not, there's a role for having independent objective, just third party uh, uh, kind of feedback. Actually, some really good companies like Two Hat, for example, um, just acquired by Microsoft, really good uh, moderation uh, company in the gaming uh, space, which is, I don't know if everyone knows, is an extremely toxic place to play around. Um, uh, really good attitude from, from Chris Preeb there, who actually is really interested in working with other companies just to challenge his own models because um, he recognizes that challenge. Like, doesn't matter how good you are, unless you're getting your models and the way you're working independently, objectively assessed, it's really hard to do a good job of it. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear more about sort of how gaming relates to this problem, if you if that's something you feel like commenting on. Well, I, I can explain to the challenge of it, because um, if you imagine um, the challenge of trying to moderate a, a chat on Facebook between normal people, which is unlikely to include a, a lot of talk about suicide or death or killing, and then take that into an environment where that's a part of the game, um, where, you know, hands up, I'm Call of Duty player. Um, I talk about killing a lot um, because it's part of the game. Um, or in some cases, extremely, you've got the cases of, should I just go and suicide? Yeah, I'll go and suicide. <laughs> I'm not going to go and suicide. That's part of the gameplay. But how to differentiate that when, when you're trying to apply any form of artificial intelligence to it? That's where you really, a human intel intelligent operation is, is the only solution because um, trying to um, discover the nuances of people being able to completely openly, ordinarily talk about killing and death and murder and suicide, um, but then recognize when in that same situation they're talking about it in real life in a different manner, that is extremely difficult um, for any form of AI. Absolutely, all those nuances are really hard to tell. I think also the um, industry applications that you're both hinting at is, is very exciting. One of our alumni from SEPA started TruePick and the idea was he was had been in the State Department and saw how much time was spent trying to verify, if, you know, whether or not images were accurate, right, before the government goes in and does something. Um, but also so useful for things like insurance companies. So you can see when someone takes a picture of their leaky floor, is it actually recent or is it 10 years old? So I, I wonder to what extent you feel like these commercial applications will also help stimulate the development of this kind of technology. You know, I, I, to me, the, 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 what's exciting about this particular time is there are a lot of solutions, but there hasn't been nearly as much demand as one would have thought, because the demand to some degree is likely to come through the platforms when they are put in the position where they have to take, take actions, where they actually have to protect people's safety. And as Anthony says, until they do, there's an opening for uh, new entrants, in the market. So there's a, 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 a new search engine I, I recommend people check out called Neva, N-E-V-A, started by a, a fellow named Sridhar Ramaswamy, who, was, who ran Google's advertising business for several years. And it's an example of what a consumer focused search engine looks like. We're now so used to the typical model, which is really designed for advertisers. And the, the consumer version is quite different. It's what am I really trying to find out? I may not be in the mood to buy something, so don't tell me about a, a product. Um, let me combine my information with public information. Um, and, and 
you know, uh, Neva provides online safety tools, including against misinformation. Uh, and it was the first you know, significant search engine to do that. So I think there is gonna be innovation among smaller companies, but I do think the solution to this problem is gonna come largely when the existing large digital platforms are required to take steps that they should have been required to take a long time ago. I'd, I'd say in addition to that, there's like there's many kind of lenses of looking at this problem. And one, one way is looking at is the content that's being shared on the platforms and either looking to the platforms or working with the platforms to, to tackle the content. We've taken, just to, to expand, we've taken a basically completely different approach, uh, which is in our view, um, we don't want to be the single arbiter of the, of the truth or, or facts online because of the bias issue. What we're doing actually is, is uh, directly targeting the brands, because if you think about um, vaccine misinformation, for example, that um, a vaccine, take a particular brand's vaccine, take a Pfizer vaccine, is going to give you brain cancer or, or whatever the, the piece of fake news is. Um, it's Pfizer's PR team is interested in solving that particular lie, that particular piece of misinformation. Or if you see another lie about you know Adidas having slaves in their supply chain somewhere, right? Adidas's PR team is the one interested in that particular lie. So we we took a view of if we could just arm all of the organizations and all of the actors with the tool set to identify the harmful content, every organization could could monitor and control their little piece of the internet, their little piece of the conversation. So if we scale this broad enough, that is our way of tackling this kind of from reverse angle, rather than where it's being shared, is give every organization the tool set to, to own and care about their own little bit uh, of, of the conversation. So in a, in a, in a gold rush scenario with a, with the picks and shovels guys, right? We're not, we're not trying to find the golden nuggets. We're going to sell the picks and shovels so that everyone can find the golden nuggets themselves. That's kind of how we're, how we're approaching it. Really interesting. Thank you. Um, I wanted, I know that Gordon um, has another Zoom after this, uh, but before I let you go, I just wanted to give the audience a chance to weigh in with any questions. Um, really, really interesting um, subject. And obviously I could carry on for hours asking you more things. Um, anybody out there have a question or the organizers? Any last thoughts from the panelists? Well, it may, may, I, I think I'm just responding to Anthony's um, observation about the communications departments at companies. That's fantastic to hear that, you know, that there are solutions for them. Those are very real brand problems for those companies. We operate down the hall from that person where ironically, virtually every large company through programmatic advertising is supporting misinformation sites. <laughs> uh, we found more than 4,000 advertisers whose ads are running on sites that publish misinformation about COVID, for example, including the Centers for Disease Control, the US Health Agency. And it is, again, in the nature of programmatic advertising, nobody intends to do this. But thousands of significant sources of misinformation and hoaxes live on unintentional programmatic advertising revenue. And Facebook knows this, Google knows this, the entire ad tech community of demand side platforms and supply side platforms. And you know it's a very complicated, very large industry. It's a quarter of all of the advertising in the world is programmatic advertising, half of digital advertising, programmatic advertising. So as Anthony said earlier, it's $180 billion of money sloshing around, a lot of which is going to fund these hoax sites, which helps to explain why there's so many of them. So if there's one thing that companies can do that are you know, serious about using, you know, operating for good, uh, it would be to add to their ESG responsibilities. Let's join the fight against online misinformation simply by making sure that our ads don't unintentionally support those websites. Um, and I was wondering, Gordon, to what extent, one of the things that I was hearing in Brussels is that some of the MEPs are right now trying to put a ban on micro-targeting into the Digital Services Act. 
I don't think that's going to get through, but I'd be curious to know whether either of you think that would actually um, solve the problem. Is it a good idea? I mean, my, my perspective uh, on this is that um, the, the, the real problem is, is quite simple. The real problem is um, it's an unusual, maybe unique feature of social media and search that they treat all information the same. No publisher would ever imagine thinking that way. So to me, it's not the micro-targeting, it's not you know, any of the aspects the technology has made possible that ha do have many benefits. It's the very simple uh, lack of liability, lack of responsibility, lack of accountability on the part of these platforms for the known online harms they're causing. It's not just in misinformation, by the way, it's you know, in bullying and grooming, and uh, there are all kinds of, of, of very well-known social harms, some of which are actually also illegal, um, that the platforms can and should be required to do, to take more steps uh, to fix. And you know, I, I think it's great, uh, to have other uh, critiques of them, but this is a very practical problem that can be solved in in the short term. Um, I, I, I see. Agree. Sorry, go ahead. I, say, I, I, I agree with Gordon. Micro targeting isn't the problem. You know, if, when we move into a cookie-less future, this problem isn't going to go away. There are a few questions, some of which I feel like we've you've sort of already covered. I mean, I think that on re legislation, I think Gordon already talked about the need for sort of common law to apply rather than a sort of full um, exempt release of the companies from from liability. Uh, question about how can we become more discerning? And I would put a plug in for your services, actually. I think that these browser extensions and um, labeling mechanisms are, are actually very, very helpful. Um, and then a question you may want to answer, I mean, answer obviously any of them, but I think one that you may want to answer that we haven't touched on is sort of where do you see the future? Where will the threats come from in the future on this on online mis and disinformation? Yeah. Um, so let, let's um, let me fast forward to a world where the digital platforms have to take some minimal steps to protect their users, and the infodemic of misinformation is tamped down to some degree. I think we'll then be back in the more comfortable world of uh, uh, certain governments trying to affect beliefs and activities of others, uh, the sort of Russian, Chinese, Iranian. Uh, activities that will never go away. You know, it's even a, I suppose, a form of legitimate uh, foreign policy for those countries, and I suppose Western countries too. Um, but that's a form of uh, modest enablement. The true problem with the digital platforms is recommendation engines that favor false information, divisive information that happens also to include propaganda. Maybe I could take just 30 seconds. I, I think to Americans, the idea of legislation in this area seems so fraught, and indeed it is. The debate in Washington is, is fairly sterile. On one side, there are people who say, if you touch section 230, the internet will fall apart, can't be done, we'll lose our free access to search and social media. And on the other side are people who say, let's abolish it altogether and let's have the government regulate content on the internet. Neither of those is a good outcome. Uh, I think that's why uh, we've encouraged people in Washington and uh, legislators and people in the executive branch and uh, elsewhere to look to the UK model and to the European model uh, of simply restoring basic common law responsibilities to the digital platforms. That's not a terrifically complicated uh, process. In practice, uh, it means the platform's taking steps to reduce harm, and they can choose how they want to do that. Um, but I think, we, I, 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 I do think it's likeliest that we'll see 
effective legislation first from the UK where the parliament has been on this case for two years, Anthony, maybe longer. And you know, if you watch a parliamentary hearing on misinformation, it's quite illuminating and sophisticated, I would say, particularly in contrast uh, to ours, which tends to be you know, quite partisan and not always as uh, sophisticated about the nature of the problem as it should be. Well, since, since Brexit is when the UK kind of got its first kind of population level kind of exposure to the problem. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's, been quite, it's been quite prominent in our conversation since then. Um, I, I think I'd, I'd say I'm, I'm a little less optimistic that we're going to get to that, to the to panacea you mentioned, or at least we were going to get there anytime soon. I think the, the challenge is, um, even, if, even if legislation like that comes in, even if regulation comes in, that we might see um, a reduction in the amount of organized creation of misinformation, disinformation for, for making money. But the, the problem is on the supply side that anyone can create that kind of content. And it's actually very easy for, for that kind of, you know, the micropayment services in, in, and monetization of that content, even in small amounts, is actually quite, quite easy. And it's been very hard to, to catch the individuals just shopping it for themselves. Um, so I think for me, um, a lot more effort will need to be put into the demand to the um, kind of to the demand side, where you are either being protected by your browser um, or earlier on. And we haven't spoken about this much, but I think um, doing that kind of li li media literacy and the critical thinking training uh, and exposing people at a much earlier age to these kind of challenges, like which is the, the whole generation is growing now with zero protection, zero rules, zero legislation, zero even awareness of the issue. And we've damaged forever damaged that that portion of, of the generation which is going to grow older now whereas kids coming through now maybe are getting a better start um at this um whereas those that that elder generation like my generation really came into the internet and, and started when it was that golden era of literally free-flowing information it wasn't heavily monetized we we're literally just doing it to help each other out um that i think gave us a naive sense of oh isn't this isn't this this place this whole uh, arena great for us and then kind of just sucking down uh the uh, the monetization uh, of content after that i think it's damaged us so yeah I, I think we're gonna have to put more effort into the demand side really um because i think it's going to be way too hard to completely stamp out the supply side i couldn't agree uh, more I, 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 Gordon, I, last words before yeah, you go i i saw one one last question which does relate to the supply side anthony so there are steps that can be taken the question is how hard is it for companies to keep their programmatic ads off of inappropriate sites. Uh, it, it, what, what has happened is there are, there's an industry of brand safety companies um, that do an excellent job of keeping programmatic ads off of pornographic sites, for example, or sites dominated by hate speech. They can do that with AI. They, and many advertisers I think had assumed that their ads were being kept off of misinformation and hoax sites by their traditional brand safety companies. These are multi-billion dollar companies with names like Double Verify and IAS and Oracle. Um, they don't actually protect, protect against ads on misinformation sites. So it's opened the door for little companies like NewsGuard to have a list that we license. We work with Publicis and Omnicom and IPG and directly with advertisers to say, here's a list of sites you really don't wanna be on. We tell them how many of them they've been on. They're always shocked. And then we say, and by the way, we've identified thousands of high quality local news sites, high quality sites serving the black community or Hispanic community or LGBTQ plus communities that really have suffered because of programmatic ads are not selected for programmatic ads. And the, the result of that is the companies can be sure their ads don't support inappropriate sites and have the PR problems that Anthony's contacts have to worry about, while also supporting high quality journalism and ending up with lower costs for the ads and greater engagement. Well, that's terrific. You're both really inspiring. And I'm happy to say that I've just been asked to update the report. So I will be busy rereading the transcript and quoting from it. Um, really glad that Columbia Business School has offered us the chance to get together and catch up and hear some of the latest. And thank you to the audience. I know it's a really busy time of year and I, I think it's terrific how many people showed up. So thank you very much and lovely catching up with everybody. Really inspiring. Thank I you. wish you the best. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you to the business school. Cheers. Bye.